Good morning, everyone. s o p o s t i a n guys. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning to all of you who are online. So good to be here. And uh, I know many of you uh, ask me a lot of questions about True North Church. So we were planted out of uh, BBC six years ago in the city of Midrand. And I just want to say to you, on behalf of True North Church, thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you so much for your continued support for us. Uh, for many churches, as you would know, COVID was not a cool time at all. Whether in terms of membership or uh, financially, but God has been so good to us that as we've come back to church, much like with you guys, we've seen new faces, and uh, we know that uh, as True North Church, we could not have done or continue to do what we're doing by ourselves. So thank you, BBC, for your prayers, for your care. I bump into guys here in Bryston. First question they ask me: Hey, how's True North Church? We're doing well by the grace of God, and so we continue to be a church that makes an impact. In the city of Midrand, would you continue to pray for us that as time goes on, because as you might have noticed, Midrand is the fastest growing city in this nation, that God would lead us and other churches to continue the gospel work, to be faithful, to reach more people for Jesus Christ. In fact, our church was praying for you guys this morning, just like we do every single Sunday, because you are our parents in the faith. So thank you so much. So whatever blessings that you are seeing, we want to receive of that as well. Okay, so if you want to hear anything more about Trinity Church, you can talk to me after the service. This morning, I want to start off with a question. It's not a quiz; just a question. I'm speaking to the marrieds now, and I know those of you who are single, black, like, but why are we being left out? The thing is that the answer in your case is pretty obvious. To those who are married in this room, who takes up the trash in your home? Who takes it? Hey, guys, be confident. Is it you? Yeah. <laughs> Who takes the trash in your home? Okay, I think this, this is a silent crowd, but from the show of hands, I can see it's mostly the guys, right? By a wide margin. So much for equality, ladies. You want equality everywhere, but not with the trash. Kind of like y'all deal with it. Ladies, can I tell you a secret? Unlike Homer Simpson, who finds every trick in the book not to take out the trash, most guys don't mind taking out the trash. I know when you talk to your husband about that, they might ah again. He might sound grumpy. He might be annoyed. But the truth is, most men enjoy taking the trash out. You know why? It gives us a few moments to be alone. <laughs> To reflect and think on my day alone. So during lockdown, I received that, brother. <laughs> during lockdown, trash day was the only day I got to see other people, other men, in other words. So it'd be quiet. It was eerie. But on trash day, you heard gates opening and trolleys. Ah! Yes, we get to see each other as men. I'd get back in the house after 30 minutes or so, and my wife was like, "That was long." And I'm like, yeah, I got to see other people. I thought I was the only guy left, but I'm not. Some of you are wondering why we talk about trash on a Sunday morning. Glad you asked. It's because our text this morning takes us to the dustbin so we can get some theology. So all of us, ladies included, we're all gonna go there and hear what God has to say to us. We're continuing in our series in One Peter as we talk about a life of significance. We are in First Peter chapter two, reading from verse one. So put away, Peter says. Your translation might say therefore, put, meaning that verse one is a continuation of what Peter has already said to us in chapter one. So he says, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, verse three of our text is a hinge point of these two sentences. So we are going to start there. Peter says, "If indeed that the Lord, if indeed you have tasted rather that the Lord is good." This if at the beginning of this verse. It's not a conditional if, like if you feel like it or if you want to listen. A better reading of this text would be, since indeed, it's emphatic. 
since indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Remember what Peter has already said to us in chapter number one. He says, God's lavish grace has been poured out toward us. He told us about the living hope. He told us about our pure and and enduring inheritance. And then last time we focused on the love that God has for us. So Peter says, guys, God has been good. So since God has been good to you, he has shown you grace, he's given you hope, he's given you an inheritance, and he's shown you love, now it's your turn. Your turn to do what? To live differently. Because God has been good, you're called to live differently. And this radical new way of life says you need to take some stuff to the trash bin. So he says, put away, get rid of some vices. The first one he speaks of is envy. Envy is characterized by someone who is always discontent. You are never happy. God gives somebody a wife and there you're like, but God, I've been praying for a wife for a long time. Why them? I tithe. Why them? You are envious. So he says, put it away. Go to the dustbin and chuck it. He says, slander. This is about making false and damaging statements about other people. And we see this on social media all the time. Keyboard warriors, chuck, 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 saying nasty stuff because they know that they'll never be caught. So he says, put it away. Hypocrisy, and I know no one in this room is a hypocrite, right? (laughs) To be a hypocrite is to claim that you have higher standards or beliefs than what really is. I love this. Because Jesus, because during, during Jesus' ministry, he used to call the Pharisees and Sadducees hypocrites. Because they were the guys who were saying, hey, I am so spiritual. Hey, I am so generous. Check me out. The original Instagram influencers. But Jesus says, you guys are hypocrites because what you're displaying to the public is not who you really are. Peter says, because God has been good to you, Chuck that in the dustbin. He goes into malice. This is anger and hostility toward other people. Now, I'll be honest. I get angry. I get irritated by people. But with malice, he says, it doesn't just stop there. It goes a bit deeper. If you had an opportunity, you would kill those people. You might have malice toward a husband, a wife, or a father, Yes, they've hurt you, but for you, it's about making sure that they don't exist anymore. Peter says, you need to chuck that. The last one, he says, deceit. And all of us are deceitful when we think we can get away with something. We want to save our skin, so therefore we will lie and do all manner of things. This is where deceitful. So he says, since God has been good to you, you need to get rid of these things. Did you notice that all these vices have to deal with interpersonal relationships? All these vices affect how we relate to one another as people. They destroy relationships, even as we're trying to build lives of significance. If we are found there, we won't get where we need to go. I know what some of you are already thinking. I'm not like that. I'm not envious. I'm not malicious. Well, at least to my friends, I'm not. We tell ourselves that we don't engage in this behavior. We try to mask the filth instead of getting rid of it. So in our culture out there, you hear stuff like, hey, these are normal human reactions. If you're malicious, don't be too malicious. A little bit of a bad thing isn't too bad. Or the one that I love most. If you're envious, baby, use that to drive your career. Use that to move ahead in life. Envy must make you move to the next step. You see, when we make excuses for the filth in our lives, this is what we're doing. (laughs) 
we make the filth smell nice. Until somebody says, what's the smell? Oh, no, it smells okay here. Yeah? What's the smell? And after a while, the filth that's there will begin to decay and rot. And the real smell shows. Here's the thing about coming to Jesus. Jesus doesn't want us to moss this up. Jesus says, get rid of it. Put it away. That's his call to us because he's been so good to us. So once we put the trash away, how do we ensure that our hearts stay continually clean? How do we ensure we don't go back to the trash heap? Friends, if we want to live a life of significance, number one, we are to desire the word of God. Verse two, like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. And so Peter uses the metaphor of a child at her mother's breast. Medical science tells us that mom's milk is the primary source of nutrition for newborn babies. It has all the fat, protein, carbohydrates, minerals, and vitamins that the baby needs. Not, just, not only does it give the good stuff, but breast milk also contains protective agents that ensure that baby doesn't get infections. And there are many more benefits that we could list. Peter says, likewise, for you to grow in your faith, for you to grow in salvation, you have to desire the word of God like baby desires milk. Peter is saying to us, it's not just good enough just to throw this away. You need to replace the junk with something greater. And that something greater is the word of God. I know oftentimes when pastors talk about the word of God, most of us feel guilty because we know that we don't spend time with God's word as we should. It's just a book we have in our home or an app on our phone. Newsflash, I'm not here to guilt you into reading your Bible. I'm not here to guilt you into reading your Bible. When I was in Vosti, I had professors who taught me all about the Bible taught me the Greek and the Hebrew, declensions and conjugation, great. But there's one thing that I saw. For all their knowledge about the Bible, it did not change them. People who read it a lot, but nothing happened in their heart. In one particular conversation with one of my professors speaking about the Old Testament, and he said to me, well, those are fairy tale stories for my kids. I read them just before they go to bed. So my hope when we're done this morning is that you would come to recognize the Word of God not just as another book or app to have, but as a lifeline, much like baby's milk, that you need this in order to live. You see, you can offer baby gold or money, but that won't stop baby from crying. Baby will keep on howling until you give it what it needs, milk. Likewise, we need to realize that our spiritual life is real. It's more real than the air we breathe. So Peter says, long, desire. This is the same word that David uses in Psalm 42 when he speaks about how much he longs for the presence of God. He says it's just like a deer panting for water, a deer seeking water. Now, if you know anything about a deer, you would know that it is a fragile animal. And it's always running away from danger, right? And so it needs water to help it to cool down from all the running that it does. And so when it seeks water, it's so that it can find sustenance. Because many times as it's being chased by its predators, it can't find food. So water is its life source. Water helps it to cool down. But here's another thing that water does for the deer. As its predator is chasing it, the deer is able to go to a pool of water and somehow lose its scent there. And the predator is confused. What David is saying to us in that psalm is that God's word is nutritious for us, but not only that, it is protection. We need God's word to, in order to grow, but we also need God's word in order to be protected from the evils of this world. This is God's word for us. 
Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That says, in as much as you need physical food to grow, you need God's word in order to grow in the inner man. It's vital. If you're going to eat three meals a day, how often are you going to dip into God's word? So yes, this will begin by you just reading the Bible, but here's the incredible thing as you begin to read God's word. Something begins to happen in your heart and in your mind. The Holy Spirit activates God's word and your mind is renewed. And then all of a sudden, you are no longer malicious. All of a sudden, you're no longer envious because God's word has been working and nourishing and growing you. Child of God, we need to be hooked on God's word. David says, I'm so hooked on God's word, I feel like snacking on it all day long. Those of you who've had kids know this. Baby doesn't eat all at once and it's like, ah, oh, it's done for the day. Now they want to snack every now and then, mess around, disturb your plans. David says, that's, our, that's what our relationship with God should be like. God, I just want to spend some time in your word. 30 minutes there, 10 minutes here, 5 minutes there. Why? Because it is life to me. It sustains me. Because as we snack on it, we overcome the sins that we got rid of. See, this call to be in God's word, to be obsessive in God's word is a call to all of us. Speaking of obsession, I'm somebody who's obsessed with basketball. I know I'm short, but yeah, compared to the basketball players. But I love basketball. And one of my favorite players is Kobe Bryant. Kobe was obsessed with being the best basketball player in the world. And so Kobe figured out that if he woke up at 4 a.m. every morning, he could get two extra hours of practice more than his teammates. So he'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, spend time exercising, working out, and then join the team because his obsession was to be the best. Even in the off-season, Kobe would keep the same routine because he wanted to be the best. He broke his right wrist, his dominant hand, and so he couldn't play. And most of us would feel sorry for ourselves. Ah, I can't participate anymore. But with a cast in his right hand, Kobe began to play with his left hand. And by the time the cast came off, he was just as good with his left hand. This guy was obsessed. But we don't have to go looking too far for people who are obsessed. You and I have friends who are obsessed with gym, right? Don't make a coffee appointment when I go to gym. Guys who are obsessed with that diet, I'm carnivore, nothing else. Don't give me anything else. Or the new fad, I'm vegan. Or friends who are obsessed with their jobs. See, being obsessed with your job or your diet, nothing wrong with that. The thing is, all that you're doing doesn't go into the next life. It stops here. But being obsessed about the Word of God ensures that it has an internal reward, an eternal reward because that's what God's Word does. It has an eternal reward. So it's worth your while to invest in something that will never perish, something that will always be there. I know what another third of you is saying. Yeah, Maratumi, this is easy for you to say. Pelafoena, reading the Bible is part of your KPIs. <laughs> the more Bible you read, you might get a promotion. The rest of us, life ain't so easy. You know, that might be true, but I've realized something. Is that I too need to grow. I need to mature. And the more I read God's word, I will not be malicious. The more I read God's word, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be somebody who is envious. So this is a challenge for all of us. Because all of us need to grow regardless of who we are or what we do. 
Or there's probably another group of people who are like, well, I am reading the Bible, but I'm getting nothing out of it. Or I'm reading the Bible, but I'm not changing. You know, that reminds me of a conversation I had with my daughter this very week. I'll be comfortable because she and I are very comfortable. And so she came to my study as I was preparing for this week, and she says to me, Papa, I'm worried about you. Okay. What's up? You're always teaching the Bible. Okay. If you stay in this job for another 10 years, I think you'll run out of stuff to say. (laughs) You've been in ministry so long that you'd have taught the Bible more than once, and people will catch you out, and they'll say, this man is not saying anything new. So I'm worried that if you stay in this job, nothing new will come out. Good observation, right? So I said to her, Nana, why do you read the Chronicles of Narnia every year? Now, my daughter is a massive C.S. Lewis fan, and she's been reading the Chronicles of Narnia since she was seven. She's now 13. Last week, she just started reading it for 2022. So I said to her, why do you always read this book? You know the story, right? She says, no, I know the story off by heart. I really know the story. So why do you read it? Something struck her. Her eyes lit up. And she went, every time I read it, I understand something I didn't get before or I see something new. Friends, that's my prayer for you. That as you read God's word, God would illuminate your understanding. God will illuminate your eyes to see more and more of him. That as you continue to dive deep into God's word, the Holy Spirit would open up your heart and say, hey, you've read this a thousand times, but this time he has something. You need to drink deep of God's promises. Especially in times such as this, where things are dark and bleak, you need to be drinking deep from God's promises promises. And so Peter says we need to invest in God's word so we might grow thereby. But he's not done. He continues to say to us, if you want to keep the garbage out, point number two, be part of the building. Verse four, as you have come to him, A living stone. This always hits me because it's an oxymoron. A living stone? If you've played with stones as a kid, we we used to, you know, make buses out out of bricks. They are not living. But Peter says, a living stone. Jesus is one who is dependable. That's what he's pointing us to. He's immovable. Jesus, who's a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 7, So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. Now, in ancient times, the builders would begin the building by putting down the cornerstone. The cornerstone, most of the time, was the largest stone. The cornerstone determined the height and width of all the other walls in the building. In other words, all the other bricks in the building had to correspond to the corner stone. They had to fit the pattern of the first stone. Peter says in God's kingdom, Jesus is that corner stone. If you want to come to me, I've given you a blueprint and Jesus is the corner stone. There is no other way that you can come to me except through Jesus. And he says to us, if we have put our trust in Jesus, the cornerstone, we will not be put to shame. He goes back and he points to Isaiah and the prophets and he says, Israel longed for the Messiah to come. But when he came, they did not recognize him. 
Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, all the guys who've been reading the old prophets who were praying for and looked, longing for the Messiah were offended by him. Jesus became a stumbling stone as opposed to a cornerstone in their lives. So we need to understand, if I'm in Jesus, my shape needs to take his shape. But if I'm not in him, I will stumble. And in our day and age, people are offended when they hear the demands that Jesus makes of us. Because we want to please ourselves. We want our own desires. We reject Jesus. And Peter says to us, when Jesus becomes a stumbling stone, that is hard. We'd rather manipulate and be malicious, choose our own way. But I love God. Despite the fact that we want our own way, God still calls out to us. He shows us his goodness. He says, come. Here is the right way. Build your life. Pattern your life on my son. Once you come to Jesus, you become a living stone. I want you to think of a building And as you think of the building, listen to what I've got to say. When we think of coming to Jesus, most of us think of me, me, me. We write songs about how I want to grow spiritually. We write books on that. Our focus is on me. But listen to the words that Peter uses. You are a living stone among other living stones. Part of a building. When Jesus calls you to be a living stone, he doesn't call you to be by yourself. He calls you alongside others. You are called to be part of the building that God is building. You are not on your pace. Verse 5. You yourself, you yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. It says to us that as we leave our junk behind, as we love on God's word, we need to do that alongside other believers. Spiritual maturity is a family affair. Spiritual maturity is a family affair. Think about it. It's only in our families where people take the rubbish that we dish out, right? But it's also in our families where we are pushed to be better. When mom, dad, brother, and sister can say, you just did a lot of rubbish now, but you can do better. Stop. Peter calls us to be found in places where people are offering spiritual sacrifices. And that happens when you're alongside brothers and sisters in the local church. Because in the local church, we offer first ourselves. Scripture says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. That means I am known by God, but not just by God, I am known by you too. How do you prove your love for God? Not by how much you give, not by how much you pray, but by how you love your brothers and sisters. And in God's house, all of us are presenting sacrifices that are acceptable to God because my life is open to Him, my life is open to others. That's how I grow spiritually, by bringing myself to God. But we also offer other kinds of sacrifices. I just want to touch on one this morning, sacrifices of prayer. You see, when you're rooted in a local church, other believers are able to pray for you. Other believers can say, God, we want to stand in the gap for so-and-so. We don't want them to end up in the rubbish heap again. God, would you intervene in their lives? We know them. They're open to us. Therefore, we can pray rightly. That is being part of a living stone in God's house. And I've discovered that the more I pray for people, it's pretty hard for me to be malicious. When I pray for people, love for the house grows in my heart. 
and I will not exhibit any of that filth. So he says, drink deeply of God's word, but be rooted with God's people. These sacrifices please God and we get, them, get to do them together in community. A significant life realizes that spiritual maturity is of necessity. In light of what Jesus has done for us, we have to mature. In our modern day churches, we can measure maturity through how well we teach the word of God and you get good teaching here. Through how great we sing. We just did that this morning. How much we give. We just heard of God's blessings. But Jesus is pushing us a bit further. And today's word is saying to us, in order to mature, as you mature, mature by discarding certain behaviors. Chuck them in the bin. Mature by longing of, by desiring God's word. And mature by being part of God's people. This is a call for those who have seen the goodness of God. We want to display that goodness out into the world for God's glory and our good. Let's pray. Father God, first we want to say thank you for your goodness toward us. That in Jesus there is so much grace, so much love. There's an unwavering hope. This living hope. There's an inheritance that does not perish. God, you have indeed shown us and given us so much in Jesus. So Father God, we want to say thank you. Thank you that through Christ, we get the right blueprint for life. We get to be in relationship with you. So God, I pray that may we be a people who realize that we need to mature. We need to discard things that don't please you. It could be malice, it could be envy, it could be anything else. I pray, Lord God, that may we be people who realize that we need to mature, we need to grow. I pray, God, that you would give us a deep love of your word. That we would long for your word. I pray, God, that even as we read this word, that the Holy Spirit would illuminate it in our minds and in our hearts. I pray, God, for a gift of faith, that we'd be a people of God who not only see the words, but believe the words. And we see you, Lord God, at work in us. So God, give us faith to believe for change. Lives that are transformed. Lives that have been radically changed by your word. I pray to God for people who are weary in this season. Would you give them your word, God? May they find it fresh again. May they have seasons of refreshing in their lives. Finally, Lord God, I pray for people who are looking for a local church or who are not too sure where they stand. So God, if, even if they're here this morning, God, let this be their home where they can be part of God's building here and grow in maturity with other people. Would you give us a deep love for each other, God? A deep love for your church. Because that is where we can offer sacrifices that are acceptable. We thank you, God, that your word never comes to condemn. 
when it comes to exhort, to encourage. So Lord God, may we walk out of here, Lord God, encouraged by it. That we can mature, we can grow. We can see God at work in our lives. Thank you, God. And so, Lord God, God, even as we sing once more this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you are doing an incredible work in our hearts throughout this place and even to those who are at home. Sift us, Lord God. Be at work.